What, 60 seconds away? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Ouch. Oh, so in the same room, that'd be a little obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it's fine on those computers. Yeah, it's good for the period. It's yeah. a little delayed. It might be the Wi Fi. Like, oh, on those computers, it's, it's perfect. Like, really? you talking at the same time as talking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, right now. Actually, what you, uh, we're generous revenue. You should charge 10 bucks to log in. Yeah. We'll see about the demand. Yeah. All right, ready to get started? Welcome yeah. to Studio G Networking Hour live. It's the first, the first uh, Studio G Networking Hour live on, on Facebook, so it should be a lot of fun. Um, if anybody's watching on, on uh, Facebook, just send us some comments and uh, we can get your questions going through that way too. So let's get started. Uh, we're going to talk about discipline entrepreneurship today, specifically uh, what you can do for your customer. Discipline entrepreneurship is made up of six themes. Uh, we're going to cover the second one today. Two weeks ago, we covered who is your customer. Um, throughout the semester, we'll get through all six themes. Under what you can do for your customer, we're going to be talking about a full life cycle use case high-level product specification, quantifying a value proposition, defining your core, and charting your competitive position. Um, and the way all these steps fit, fit together is, is really about uh, this holy grail for specificity. Um, this is really the key to making your business happen. The more specific you can get about what you're trying to do, uh, the more likely it is to become a reality. So that's kind of the theme throughout the entire book. So to get started with the full life cycle use case, what this is, is a visual representation of the full life cycle of current solutions and also your product. So you map out what does it look like for um, customers now, and then what is it going to look like once they have the product. And some key things you want to want to point out are how does your customer understand the need for your product? How do they find out about your product? How do they acquire it, use it, get value from it, pay for it, and then buy more and tell others about it? This is an example of a, a product that they, they sold a way to measure um, the space you had in your house. So when you bought furniture, you know it was going to fit. Um, and what they spelled out here was the status quo. So somebody wants furniture at home, they research and plan, they browse, and then they buy something, they find out it doesn't fit. Then they have to return it. So that's the pain point that this product is supposed to address. And so then what they uh, designed was you know, a design where you can upload pictures of your room or a 360 video and then be able to have the exact sizes so then when you uh, order furniture, you know it's going to fit. <clears throat> you really want to be looking through the eyes of the customer when you're talking about this life cycle. You want to map out how your persona uses the product once it's acquired and then that acquisition, also post-acquisition support cases. Um, could be visual, diagrams, flowcharts. things to ask. If I'm a target customer, what will happen to me to make me buy this product? Um, people don't just find out about your product through magic. They need to be advertised to in some way. They need to discover it somewhere, see it on Amazon. And so you really want to figure out how are you going to make this event happen where the target customer learns about, about the product. We'll go buy it. 
Um, think about what a customer would Google to buy this product or solution. What are the gaps in your sales process? When you think about sales process, think um, awareness, interest, consideration, purchase. Are there any gaps in your current processes that are preventing somebody from making it through all the way to where they actually purchase the product? How much maintenance will the customer require? So what are you putting yourself on the hook to do when you uh, sell somebody something? Where can and will value be delivered and captured? And so you really wanna think about for that specific customer and this product, where's the value being delivered? Because if there's parts that are not valuable, you may wanna eliminate those. Any questions for me? Here's a uh, maintenance customer, like having like a, that customer retention and keeping them, you may always say, you know, it's easier to retain a customer than getting a new customer. I think that's one area that we don't always think through. We're like, oh yeah, if you get like a thousand customers, we'll be profitable. And it's like, oh, can you service a thousand customers though? Yeah. And then depending on your model, it may be a small initial product and then you're trying to upsell, so how do you manage that relationship? Some good tools for this. This comes from Doubt to Be Done. Um, it's the timeline. And what it's about is being able to plot out everything your customer goes through from first thought to uh, purchasing the product um, and how they get there. So, in general, you'll have some first thought I need some new product that does something, right? You start passively looking, then maybe some event happens and then the, the pain point becomes more severe. Then you start actively looking. Then you get to the point of deciding buying and consuming. Um, and so you can use these to uh, do market research on um, what people are doing with their with current solutions. How do they make it through the timeline? Uh, because then when you design your product, you, you can design it. So any barriers that are in that existing uh, process, you could overcome those and make your product more compelling. Um, I think a really good example for lifecycle use cases is Netflix. It kind of guides their, the way they innovate and, the, and improve their product. Um, if you think about what really made them famous was eliminating late fees. And so they put the blockbusters uh, of, of the world out of business. But they didn't stop there. They, they continued to make it easier on the customer to watch, watch videos, watch content, um, by then doing streaming video. And so now streaming is a big part of their business. And so what really got them into the game is not even really what is their main thing at this point. Um, and so you, the reason they kept innovating was, was to keep looking at ways to, to improve the customer. Any more observations on Netflix? How they made the yeah, they're no production company. Yeah, so, content generation. Yeah, but yeah, they're keeping up with all their trends. Yeah, it's pretty cool to get in. Yeah, and they've also got really good analytics on what people watch, mm -hmm. so that they know what content to produce. Content's been, been pretty popular for them. All right, so the summary on lifecycle use cases. Determine how existing needs are being met by existing products. This will allow you to see where your, um, where your product's gonna fit in the customer's value chain. And then also you can see where these uh, barriers to adoption are gonna arise. So what's gonna make it hard for somebody to make the decision to acquire your product? If you really think through the whole life cycle, you can analyze and figure out where you can uh, break down some of those barriers. Any questions on life cycle? All right, step seven is a high level product specification. This is a really powerful step. Um, um, it's more powerful than it seems. Basically what it is, is you draw out what your product's gonna be or how you're gonna market this product before you actually produce the product. And the idea is here to get um, alignment between product visions of everybody in your team. So you've got five people on your team and you actually haven't made a pro prototype, but everybody's got this vision of what that product is. Until you put it on paper and get everybody to look at it, people may have different visions. And so then this step is really about getting everybody on the same page. So you can have alignment. And then you can also start that iteration process to be refining your product. And then asking those important questions about what your product's really gonna be. Uh, in the end, uh, visual representation. Um, it's really powerful for your team, but it's also powerful for potential customers. If you do this product certification right, you can get feedback from potential customers without actually building your product. Um, and you're really answering the questions, what is the product and how does it benefit the customer? Um, 
clear as an illustration can be. Um, this one's talking about a bunch of people are, are looking at this product specification for the first time and uh, seeing that you know, maybe they didn't have the same vision as what they, they thought they did. Um, once you do start with this group product specification, it starts to spiral towards uh, the final innovation where you start iterating and making the products better and better. Um, and to do this step, basically you just want a drawing. It gives everyone on the team something to look at. You can point to it and make sure everybody's on the same page. You, you can do this by making a brochure, packaging, web page, um, whatever's going to be that first touch point for customers. Um, and generally, that's not actually building the product. You know, a lot of times if you're in Walmart, you buy a product based on the box on the outside of the product, not actually seeing the product. So think about what you can do uh, quickly before you actually make a decision to buy the product. So if you think about the Roomba, you know, it's probably a lot of work to design this product, make it so it actually works and vacuums the whole house. Um, but you can make this box and actually put together the marketing messages you know, in uh, Adobe Photoshop or something like that. To be able to show people um, a good idea of what this final product's gonna be. You get everybody on the team on the same page. And you give a good specification for what this product should look like. And you can iterate that. And then you also get feedback from customers to see if that's something that they buy, at least value proposition. And then you don't even make cross plates, you make a box. I can get customer feedback on that. Um, as seen on TV products are really good about spelling out their value proposition. So in this case, it helps your dog with a uh, few issues by helping them eat slower. Um, you don't need to make the product here. So this is the key message. You can make this type of advertisement so you can get feedback uh, before you actually have to, have to make your whoa buddy. Um, another example of a blender. You don't need to make the blender. Start writing out these marketing messages and get feedback from there. Um, for web businesses, this can be really effective where you can put together a website without the back end. So you can advertise this whole site without actually having built um, this fantasy football um, business that's become pretty popular in the last few years. Um, and you think about it, for a customer, you're going to make your decision whether you want to uh, sign up for this product based on this page. Once you get in there, then you know everything else is... Um, you know, a little more complicated, but this will at least, if they decide to click play now, that gives you an indication that they are interested in this, this type of service. So also a really powerful exercise to condense your marketing messages down to something that's this simple. All right, here's a Studio G client. Um, you can make a, a CAD model an image of the product to get feedback on it um, rather than actually producing the product. Another website with products um, you can get feedback on this type of thing to see what people would want. Um, a really good example of what you can do with these types of product specifications, to actually launched the business, it's this company WP Curve. They launched the business, um, it's this one guy, um, he had the idea of offering unlimited WordPress edits um, for a monthly fee. So somebody's got a WordPress site and then rather than having to hire a web designer to update it, you just pay this company a certain flat fee, and then you get unlimited updates. Um, and so rather than hire a bunch of people and start this whole uh, company with the back end built, he just built the front end, advertised the service, and then he just kept his phone on and he did all the updates himself. Right? But he could take payments, he could see whether people would actually buy it, and then as the service grew, then he hired more people and built the infrastructure. So it was a really low risk way to start a business. And it all starts with this general product specification of what your product's all about. And you see now he's got 38 team members and they've done 44,000 jobs. Um, and it was a really easy way to launch the, this, this, this site with low risk because he didn't scale up until he had cash flow. Um, on these product specifications, you want to think about, you want to answer things like, what does the product look like? What are its features and what do these features enable? What benefits does your customer receive? What value will you advertise to your customer? So this can be really powerful. You, you can provide a lot of different value, but you, it, it can be difficult to communicate a lot of different messages. So you really need to hone in on the best one. And these product specifications allow you to test those different messages.
Um, once you have these specifications, again, you test it out with your persona, your target customer, figure out what the benefits um, are for your customers. Uh, a lot of times you want to include a call to action. This is a good way to get feedback to see if your messaging is converting people. Taking through that sales process, awareness, interest, consideration, purchase. Um, test it with your team. And then keep iterating. So this is how your product gets better and better over time. Is uh, use the feedback you get from, from these tests to then make your product better. And here's a way of thinking about how you can gradually expand the reach of your tests. Start with a personal for personal network and gradually get more and more broad until it's a wide release. And by the time you reach at this market level, your product should be really compelling because you've got a lot of feedback and close ratings in making that product better. All right, iteration's the key. Um, don't be upset if customers don't like your first uh, brochure or your first product specification. Um, you may not be targeting them right and you may not be communicating your value appropriately. You really need to learn from their input and make improvements. And it's better to learn that they don't like um, the way you've marketed your product from the product specification than an actual product you spend a bunch of time developing and, and taking through the design process. And it's, again, really powerful for aligning the focus on your team. All right, any questions on product specification? Any examples of how you might be able to use this to test out your, your products or businesses? Basically, all this is to make propaganda for a product that still doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Some way you could be able to get customer feedback on your product uh, before you actually invest the money to make it. Okay. So you design the packaging, you design the website, you design so something that uh, is uh, more cost effective than actually producing this final product. But would allow the customer to, to get a good idea of what that product might be like. Any ideas about how you guys could use it? Can you use like a video? Uh, yeah. I'm, I was thinking about using all my products and showing it specifically to different shops. In a, like a CAD video showing like the animation of like what it's actually doing is a lot simpler than actually building the thing yeah. and trying to market it to them. Yeah, yeah that's a really good example. Um, you see that a lot of Kickstarter videos because they can saw what the product might be able to do and then um, from there raise the money to actually build it. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good example. So this step's extremely powerful and it's a really important thing to do because it can save you a lot of money. It can also make your product better once you finally get to that uh, final product stage. All right, next step is to quantify your value proposition. So you really want to be able to translate um, the, the value that you provide your customers into a quantifiable uh, metric um, because this is what's going to make it compelling to customers. So yelling is super fantastic, awesome, so much better, you know, it's not gonna really make you stand out until you have some numbers behind that or some way to really quantify uh, what, what value your product's providing. Uh, I think this is a really good example. Um, it's comparing the status quo that this was for some extreme sunscreen that doesn't wash off. So for triathletes, um, they swim first. So existing sunscreen was washed off after the swim phase and then they're getting sunburned when they're riding the bike and they're running. This, uh, this sunscreen lasts the entire, entire way through. For marathon runners, um, it doesn't wash off completely, it becomes less effective. And so this one stays effective throughout the entire way. But, so there's a way to quantify how much better this product is. So for extreme athletes that are gonna be uh, doing activities for a really long time, sweating, swimming, or whatever, uh, this sunscreen doesn't, doesn't wash off. And so then it's quantified customers know um, why they're going to be better off with this product as opposed to existing sunscreen. Um, Studio G client, the hypothesis was that um, farmers were losing a certain percentage of yield due to specific pests on organic crops. Uh, this was an organic pesticide. Uh, through the research so that made that hypothesis about the value proposition, we kept trying to value how much that was worth. Um, did this through the i -Corp process and found out that in a particular market, organic farmers can lose up to 70% of their organic finished crops um, to downy mildew. And they make $7,000 an acre on those crops. So if you can increase yield, there's a significant value proposition. And so then from there, you can calculate if this can save, it can improve yield 20%, you know exactly how much money it's worth. 
And then from there, I guess, really easy to price your product. Uh, because you're helping a, a, a business make more money, they're willing to, to pay less than that amount to make more money. Um, this was another one for cattle. Um, there was a treatment to reduce the incidence of um, some disease that, that, that kills cows. Um, and so then with the treatment, then they're able to reduce the loss uh, caused by the disease. And then at a cost of 30 bucks per calf, it was, it was cost effective to do that. Because you've got the numbers behind it that make it a compelling case for a business uh, to make that investment in your product uh, because it's going to save them money also. Um, this was actually Bill Aless' business, the, the guy that wrote this one, Entrepreneurship. Um, he had an online process for, or it was a computer-based process for uh, modeling. Um, and so it was really good for um, people that were making 3D models, and it reduced their, their time. So it went down from 16 weeks total development time to eight weeks. And so that was really um, compelling um, because time, time is money. These professionals, the people that did this were really, were really skilled. So if they had tools that allowed them to do it faster, it sped up the development times, um, and it also made it more cost effective. All right, so the key message here is that your product or service needs to be better in some way, and in some way that's really relevant to your, your customer. You need to be being these from the customer's perspective. Um, what value would the customer get out of this product is what you want to be thinking. You need to do something better, faster, cheaper, something. Um, and there needs to be some angle that's going to differentiate you from, from products that are already out there. Um, spin selling can be a way to identify this. It's a, it's a sales technique where you get custom, potential um, customers to talk about the situation, like just understand um, what are their priorities, what are their problems. Then you hone in on some of their biggest problems or maybe a problem that you can solve. You get them to quantify the implication of that problem, how much that problem is costing them. And from there, um, if they say this is costing me $100,000 a year and you have a solution that eliminates that problem for $20,000 a year, that can be a really compelling case for, uh, for a business. So, However you get there, you need to figure out some way to quantify your value proposition to make a compelling case, particularly if you're dealing with uh, businesses, because businesses are only gonna buy what's in it, helps them make money, save money, save time. Um, for consumers, it can be more subjective than that. Uh, it doesn't need to always relate back to how much money it helps them make. All right. You wanna align your value proposition with your customer's priorities. So compare the customer's current state with a possible state. Um, just like with the, the sunscreen. With this new sunscreen, you have better protection. Um, the difference between the current state and the possible state is by definition your quantified value proposition. How do you make the customer better off? All right. Any questions on value proposition? Have any of you tried to quantify value propositions for your own product? What's the difference between the value? Is there a difference between the value you offer a customer and the benefit you offer a customer? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say so. Generally, when you talk about value, you can assign some number to it. Uh, uh, it could be a dollar benefit or something, yeah. or uh, reducing throughput time or something yeah. like that. Yeah, it could make something easy, easier to use. Okay. But the concept's pretty similar. Thanks. Um, in terms of like doing things in current methods, it's a lot cheaper to use our product as a result of the cheaper production cost than what they're currently using, which would, I don't want to make a product that probably would take around three hundred dollars to sell to the to the market, but the current ones cost around six hundred. Mm. Yeah, so that can be really compelling. Yeah. yeah, if it if it's a similar experience and you're able to do it for a lower cost, definitely help. I feel like with someone that wants to make like an app or something if you're like coming up with snapchat and like quantifying that value on some of those types of things or some it, it seems more difficult mm -hmm. like when we think of like better faster those are this is more b2 to c b2b it's usually business to business seems like usually easier to quantify your value yeah because it only gets subtle business you can save the time or money but if on some b2c side stuff it seems more difficult to quantify value propositions. That's 
true. So I mean, the original value proposition for Snapchat was that your pictures don't mm -hmm. persist forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so maybe it's as simple as that. I mean, that's what people were sold on to get on Snapchat. I mean, can you, you guys think of any other ways to quantify Snapchat's value proposition? More it's about like, enhanced for privacy. Yeah. It's like a different type of social media. It allows mm -hmm. you to share with your friends like an instant snapshot of what you're doing at that period of time. It allows people who are using it for um, different things that are shouldn't be permanent um, to be temporary. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to see that, like, oh, this person took a screenshot of it. So it allows people to like do what they want, but at the same time have that sense of it's not permanent. And it okay. really comes to so is that the way you quantify the value proposition, or is there another way to do it? Well, like that, I would label it as that in like terms of like a difference between Facebook. Facebook has become extremely professional in most aspects of you're in a professional setting because it connects you to the people who are often like in part of your more professional networks. Mm -hmm. While Snapchat can be used for your friends and it won't appear as though you're doing crazy things in yeah. a more professional setting. Yeah. So I think that's a way to quantify the value proposition without a number. <clears throat> but you've at least got a clear statement about what's that value that you provide. Yeah, I think there's some like different examples there's always a way to do it but like I, I guess I keep on thinking of like things where maybe the objective is to be seen whether it's like a social application or like the one that pops in my head is if you guys remember like after Fast and Furious Dates Me there was a lot of uh, those underglow kits that people would buy for their cars and like it doesn't make my car faster it doesn't make my, <laughs> I mean like people look at my car and look cooler and, 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 and like quantifying the level of how the degree of coolness it has yeah. to your car has been a little much <laughs> <laughs> um, so I mean there's I think there's like goods like those that you could say yeah there people will buy them like if I mm -hmm. put them out there they're going to be purchased I, but then quantifying how much value that adds for them so I guess set a price um, on some of those items seems like a little difficult yeah well I guess uh, how would you Quantify the value proposition of a of a Rolex versus um, a knockoff Rolex. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a huge difference in price, but how would you go about quantifying that value? Yeah, perception. That's where I think oh. it is. Like, how I, I can perception. answer that question sure. because I, I used to have a a Nolex, which is a Mexican Rolex. <laughs> it, it cost me twenty five bucks, and you'd be amazed how many people would, it was the presidential version yeah. with fake diamonds, the whole works. Uh, you'd be amazed how many people came up to me and said, man, you spent 50,000 for a watch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so I guess you could say it's safer to have a... Oh, no big deal. It's here, so uh, yeah, I think yeah. for a particular market. It kept really good time, but the it broke in about a year and a half. Yeah. But for 25 bucks, who cares? Not bad, yeah. I think I got one of those in New York, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think it, you're on this one, Chris, where it's a, it's a lot more subjective. It's more about per, perception when you're dealing with consumers as to what they're willing to pay for. Right. Yeah. And also, a lot of the perception is about the cost of the, of the product. For example, like uh, 50000 dollars watch gives a lot more perceptions than what a five hundred dollars watch gives. No, so it's like is in that way it's not like the perception gives the price, but that the price gives the perception. So it's mm -hmm. complicated you say like you also have to say like if I give a price it will give a different perception. No yeah. more like I will see a perception and then I will try to find out the price. So this is complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. Um, but I mean, it's with luxury goods, you can, they can become more attractive at a higher price. Yep. All right, uh, step 10 is defining your core. This is really what, what, what makes your business special? Um, what's your secret sauce? Um, this is the thing that you're gonna do better than anyone else. Um, and ideally it's not going to be something that can be duplicated by customers. So you can see this is what you keep at the top of your your castle behind all these walls and protect uh, because this is what makes your business uh, special. Um, to understand this core, you know, it's, 
Right, some of it's internal introspection, uh, combination of external data, and also your personal competencies. Um, it could be mission statements, values, uh, Google don't be evil, um, which I don't think they have on their new Alphabet company, but um, that guided them for a long time. Should be concrete and specific. It can change as you learn more, um, but it's really important that you articulate it and write it down so you can get really clear about what your, what your business is all about. Um, some examples of the core. Once a company gets big enough, there could be that network effect with uh, Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp. Uh, having a critical mass makes it very difficult to compete unless you do something different, like you uh, find some way to, to make your product an alternative to Facebook, like Snapchat. Um, could be customer service, selling customer relations to retain customers. Uh, Zappos is famous for this, um, several others. For Walmart, it's logistics. You can outcompete compete on cost because um, you've got better logistics than everybody else, and therefore you're the, the lowest, uh, lowest cost uh, player in the long term. Could be user experience. Um, just the way your product, product comes out of the box, I guess, think about the product and things like that. Could be defining what, what the, the core of your company is all about. Um, so, so, so start with the internal step. Um, the core is what you can provide that no one else can. Define your business, and uh, it really shouldn't change once you figure out what your what your business is all about. Um, and you can see these cores become really um, effective at, at marketing your, your products in the future. If you think of uh, like GitHub, it, it's code repository, and their tagline is "How software gets built." Right? That's what the company is all about: is how how, how software gets built. Um, and that positions them as, as uh, the place to go for open source software. It's um, essential to maximize the value of your, your business to really understand this core. And you see a lot of really strong companies over time, they develop these cores that are um, extremely defensible. Can you think of any other examples of companies with strong cores? maybe for in and out Burger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people make a point of stopping at in and out Burger when they go out to Arizona mm -hmm. and California. Water Burger. Water Burger has a good standing in the mix yeah. in terms of quality and price. And um, just a, they label it as like the New Mexican restaurant. Like mm -hmm. it's, we got labeled by National Geographic as like the best green, cheese, green chili cheeseburger in pretty much the world. Mm -hmm. So, they stand by like their those values as to what it means to it, to be a water breaker. Yeah, that's a good example. Chick Fil A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you know, they yeah they create that demand for yeah. open Sundays. <laughs> yeah, you could have, they have strong Christian values. I yeah. guess. Uh, yeah, maybe that's what brings people yeah, up. Maybe, maybe that. But I mean, they have the secret recipe on the chicken. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I could say Phoenix. Okay, what do you say that for? Uh, the fact of like, in a way, fast and secure transportation of, yeah. of the product. Extremely reliable, one of the only ways to get And it's not only it. like in one country, it's like, it's around the world. Yeah. So, and, and it has that value of, let's get it done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that's how it differentiates from UPS and USPS and so forth. Yeah, that's a really good example. All right, step 11 is charting your competitive position. This is where you compare your strengths and weaknesses of your product versus competitors. You really wanna focus on um, your target customer's top two priorities. Um, that's because customers generally make purchasing decisions based on their top two priorities. Um, so that's what you really wanna make sure you stack up well for. Um, your biggest competitor is the status quo. By focusing on the top priorities, that makes uh, changes to the status quo more likely. All right, so here's some examples of how these look. You put priority one on the bottom and priority two on the um, y-axis. And then you plot your business um, better as you go up and then better as you go to the right on the other priorities. So some examples, and this can be really interesting because depending on your customer and their priorities, different product tries to the top. And so this 
you know, obviously people make different choices when they buy different products and they do that because they have different priorities. So you really want to analyze uh, how your product is going to stack up to your target customer's priorities to make sure it's going to be the most compelling option. So say you've got a customer and they're shopping for cars, affordability and efficiency are their, their key criteria, right? Well, an Escalade is not going to really rank high for this customer, whereas a smart car or Prius might, or a Tesla might rank good on efficiency, but not so much on affordability, right? So, but then if, if the customer, this is a different customer, if they're interested in efficiency and performance, and all of a sudden the Tesla rises to the top. Um, if it's interested in space and luxury, then the Escalade is on the top right. So let's go with an example of a grocery store. Say you've got a customer that values convenience and affordability. Where are they going to shop the most recently? Walmart. Yeah. Dollar Tree. Yeah. yeah, it could be. Yeah, even if they, <laughs> yeah, so that has what they, they're after. Um, now let's say this uh, another customer is interested in organic and local products. Where are they going to shop? Two Two farmers. 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 Yeah. farmers market. Farmers market. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So you can see um, just by understanding what your customer is after, you can know what products they're going to be interested in. And, and so um, really uncovering those those priorities for your customer is going to be key to position your product right. Um, this chart shows how well your product stacks up in the eyes of your target customer. If you're not in a good position, you, you may need to reevaluate either your, your product or your customer. It doesn't mean your product's not good, it may just mean it's not targeted appropriately to this customer or market. All right, so if you get nothing else from this presentation, you want to get specific about your product early. You want to consider your market marketing <coughs> messages day one because those are going to be the easiest for you to create. They do take some thought to really think them through, um, but it's a lot easier to come up with marketing messages than it is to design a final product. And based on the marketing message, you can get feedback on your product um, before you actually create it. Testing and quantifying um, the value propositions and also the product, very important. You want to understand your core and you want to position yourself uh, to stand out to your target customer, particularly on your top three priorities. So, not the truth will set you free, the action will set you free. You got any questions? Market. Speed market? Yeah, what does that mean? It's going to be the first market that you're going to go after. Oh, okay. So um, you want to start there. And um, do you need to know your beachhead market before you can do this last exercise? Yeah, so this is uh, the second theme in DE. First one is who is your customer. So right, once you right. figure out who your customer okay, is, so we've done that. Um, then you know what your beachhead market is. Your target customer. Their one and two priorities. Exactly. Yeah. <coughs> So that beachhead market is really the key, key market you need to secure to make your business successful. All right. Um, so we got some announcements. We've got Shark Tank coming up October 19th. You can get your tickets at sharktank.nmsu.edu. Uh, should be a lot of fun. We'll have uh, four to five uh, Studio G clients pitching. <coughs> should be pretty exciting. It's gonna be at the convention center. Um, also, applications are open for Aggie I-Corp. This is a way to get $2,000 in funding if you have a tech-related business. You can apply at icorps.nmsu.edu. Um, you just need to apply by October 17th. Uh, also, Aggie Startup Club is still open um, for applications. Um, meeting twice a month now, and you can join the club and see the schedule at, at Arrowhead slash startup. And next week, we'll be talking about value proposition design. Um, as always, you can subscribe to our events on Facebook to promise you uh, coming up and uh, that's all I got so thanks for coming and uh, enjoy the remaining PC in your life. <laughs>